a holy and faithful Father. Amen. Let's not pass this moment by. Let's lift our voices to the holy and faithful and powerful King this morning. You're so holy, Jesus.
if you knew what he brought with him when he stepped into this place. Because the thing about Jesus is he never comes empty handed. He never comes empty handed. See, where his presence is, he brings peace. Everything that we need, everything that we require can be found in the presence of Jesus Christ. Every missing piece is found in Jesus. Everything that you know that you need and everything that you don't yet know that you need can be found in the presence of Jesus Christ. when he's in the room our peace is in the room and our joy is in the room and our salvations in the room our sufficiency is in the room our breakthrough is in the room and I want you just right now to take hold of that whatever it is that you need he's offering it to you his hands are open to you right now there's nothing standing in the way of you and his presence it's you and him it's you and him you're not far from us but that you're close and that you're near that you're near if you're grateful for the presence of Jesus make some noise give him praise right now but I want to pray before we get started because I believe that God has a word for us amen amen let's pray God we invite your presence here Lord we know as the worship team sang, you fill the room. God, and in your presence, you take care of everything. So, Lord, I pray that you speak to us all individually. Let us hear. But let us not just be hearers of the word. Let us be doers, God. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about God's promises. I don't know about you, but when I get into God's word and I hear the promises of God, it brings me hope. You know, promises like he'll never leave us or forsake us. That sounds good, doesn't it? Promises that he's not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Do you know that there are 7,487 promises recorded in Scripture? That is a lot of promises that he gives to us. But if you're like me, I can hear those promises. I can even have some of them memorized. But when it comes to walking it out, it's hard. When you're in the middle of something difficult, even though you know the promises of God, it just seems like, ah, did I hear him wrong? You know, maybe I, I misinterpreted what he was saying. Did he really say that? We get to this place. There's a difference in knowing the promises of God and really walking in the promises of God. And it takes me back, if I think about uh, a couple years ago, we were all in the office at the church. There's a group of us girls, and we were eating lunch. How many of you are looking forward to lunch right now? I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Distracted everyone. But we were eating steak kebabs from one of my favorite restaurants in Baton Rouge. And I took a bite of a steak kebab, and I started choking. Stuck right there. Now, what you need to know is that a few weeks before, I love God's timing. Isn't God's timing amazing? A few weeks before, we had just gone through first aid training with our staff. So we had learned what to do in case of an emergency. We knew from the guy who taught us that we were supposed to say, is the scene safe? <laughs> Does anybody ever really do that? You know, you're in the middle of this chaos and trauma, and you go, is the scene safe? You know, but that's what we were supposed to do. And then we also learned if someone is choking, they're supposed to do a signal. What's the signal? Do you, yeah, yeah, hold your throat like this, and that signals that you're choking. I knew that too. We also knew if someone is choking, that there's proper procedure to do to help, right? To help dislodge whatever is stuck. And so here we are in this moment. This is our moment to do what we've been trained to do, right? We're going to step into it. I stood up. Steak is stuck. No one said, is the scene safe? In fact, I'm super expressive. So they just thought it was another day in the office. Marla's waving her hands like this. I was supposed to do this. Instead, I was doing this, right? They just stood up and started doing it with me. Hey, right? Had no idea. I was supposed to do this. Didn't do this. Gabby was supposed to come behind me and do the Heimlich. She did not. You know what Gabby, my friend, did? She came behind me and started beating my back. She is a little girl, but that girl had some power. She started beating my back. The good news is I survived. Praise the Lord. And I was so thankful. I'm hugging her. I'm celebrating. I'm like, thank you so much. Nobody believed me. You believed me. You beat my back. Thank you for beating my back. And she starts apologizing. And she said, Marla, I, I was supposed to say, is the scene safe? <laughs> and I didn't say that. And then she started, the wheels turned in, but you were supposed to do this. And you didn't do that. And then she said, and I was supposed to do the Heimlich, and I didn't do the Heimlich. I'm so sorry. She even came later that day and turned in her certification card. She said, I don't deserve this. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And in our lives, sometimes we come to a problem, and we know what to do. We know the promises of God. We know what he says in his word. But all of a sudden, we're in crisis, and we forget everything. We don't know where to go. Maybe you're, you're, you know God's word says, I have not given you the spirit of fear and timidity. But all you feel is fear for your future. You don't know what's next. Or maybe you know he promises peace, but right now you're in the middle of a storm and you, you're just not seeing the peace yet. Well, what do you do? How do you walk in the promises of God? Now, when I say walk in the promises, I'm talking about step by step choosing God's way. 
When I think about walking, it is a one step at a time deciding I'm going to believe and trust in the promises of God. Colossians 2, 6 through 7 says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Walk with Jesus rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Here it says walking with him is, is saying, I'm following Jesus, rooted. I'm rooted. Today I want to talk to you about walking in God's promises. There's a passage, if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Joshua chapter 6. I know the scripture is going to be behind me. Also, but I want to give you a little background on where we are because the Israelites or God's people have been promised this land. God gave them long before, but they end up as slaves in Egypt. Moses comes along and God frees them from Egypt and they leave Egypt. They're leaving slavery and they're headed towards the promised land. Now, it should have been a straight line to the promised land and it shouldn't have taken them this long but they spent 40 years in the wilderness waiting for a promise that they had received. They're wondering and they're waiting. And where we're going to pick up in this story, Joshua has now taken over in leadership. And they are about, to, they've just crossed the Jordan River and they're about to step into the promised land. You know they're excited. This is it. They've heard about it. The land flowing with milk and honey. I cannot wait. This is our moment. And look where we, we pick up in Joshua chapter 6, verse 2. It says, But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with a priest blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. So Joshua called together the priest and said, Take up the ark of the Lord's covenant and assign seven priests to walk in front of it, each carrying a ram's horn. Then he gave orders to the people, march around the town, and the armed men will lead the way in front of the ark of the Lord. So here they are. They're stepping into the promised land, and now they're facing Jericho, a city that is fortified, that has a wall around it. Now, scholars believe the promised land was very large. 300,000 square miles had been given to the Israelites. And here they are, just a few miles in, and they are now facing a wall. But I'm walking in the promises. This is this is the promise, God. But now I'm facing a wall. So how do we walk in the promises of God when we're facing obstacles? When we come to something that doesn't look like the promises of God. I know those Israelites were like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> are we in the right spot? Joshua, you're a great leader, but uh, are you sure you heard from him? Are we in the right spot? And I want to give you three things, if you're taking notes, on how do you walk in God's promises. Here are three things. The first one is this. Have the right perspective. Have the right perspective. You see in this passage, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, I have given you. I love how he uses the past tense there. He doesn't say, I am giving you. He says, I have given you. It's yours, right? It is yours. I have given you. But here they are, and they see a wall. And I can imagine them looking around at each other and saying, did Joshua say, he did give us this? This? This, this looks a little different than what I thought the promised land was going to look like. I thought it was going to be easy. We've been wondering for 40 years. Right? I thought this was the part that it was going to be easy. But he says, I have given you. You know, my, my boys, um, all three of them, do whatever their older sister says. They listen to her. Sometimes I think they listen to her more than they listen to me. 
Um, she can just tell them anything and they just do it. So the other day she told them they could never have candy ever again. She just said that. They believed her. They came in. Briggs was crying. He said, Mom, Mila said I can't have candy ever again. And I looked at him and I said, buddy, she has no authority to say that in your life. I didn't use that word. He wouldn't have known what I was talking about. And I said, you, she can't say that. And in fact, and I was starting to feel like real mom-like with authority. And I said, in fact, you got a piece of candy right now. You can go get it right now. And here's the thing. In God's word, we'll have people tell us, hey, there's no way that's possible. Or God probably didn't say that to you because now you're facing something that does not look like the promises of God. And we'll have people in our life that will say that. And I want you to hear this because often sometimes when we get to a wall, we think, did I, did I take a wrong turn? Did, did I maybe make a mistake? Did I, did I mess up something? Yeah, maybe I'm, I messed up the will of God. Let me, let me tell you something. We cannot mess up the will of God. And often when you see a wall, it is confirmation that you're exactly where he wants you to be. Somebody needs to hear that today. You have to have the right perspective. What do you see? What if we saw a wall as a gift? What if we saw it as an opportunity for God to show his power? What if every time we faced fear or we struggled with chaos in our life, that we saw it as an opportunity for God to give us peace, for God to give us a sound mind? There's a gift. We just have to look for it. You know, Jericho here probably looked scary to the Israelites, but they remembered the promise. They remembered what God had said, and they had the right perspective. So number one, have the right perspective. Number two, we have to be willing to pivot. We have to be willing to pivot. Any basketball players in the room? Okay. Where's that pivot foot? Come on, show me that pivot foot. You got to keep it planted, right? My son thinks he can change the pivot foot. He's like, just pick up the ball. We can just switch back and forth. But we have to be willing to pivot. And here the Israelites are, and they're walking into their promised land, and now they see a wall. And they had to do something different, and they probably were thinking, Joshua's got a good plan. Surely he'll have something figured out because we don't know what we're going to do. And I love what it says in Scripture, because after he tells them, I've given you Jericho, he says, you and your fighting men should march around the town. He uses the adjective fighting men, okay? So he calls for all the men that are fighting. He doesn't say, hey, where are all the marching men? Anybody in the band? Okay, you ever practice the march, right? You got to roll those, those ankles heel to toe, right? He didn't call for those people. He called for all the fighting men. Now, if you're a man in the building, you got to help me out for a second because I picture this like Joshua calling together all the fighting men and saying, hey, we're going to huddle in the tent, okay? And he calls for all the fighting men, and he says, where are all the fighting men? And they say, yeah! They're like excited to fight, right? They're into it. That's awesome. Okay. And he, he looks out and he says, I need all the fighting men. And so they come and gather, and they're in the tent. And I, I picture this like, locker room speech kind of like coach Katie would give to her players on the beach volleyball court and she's getting them ready I picture Joshua trying to get them ready right okay and they're ready and he says where are all the fighting men and they say yeah can y'all do that with me I'm gonna ask you ready where are all the fighting men yeah. that was good I'll, I'll go to battle with y'all that was good okay and he says where are all the fighting men and they say yeah and then he says, you know what we're going to do? And they say, fight. And he says, no, we're going to march. And I know they were looking at him like, we're fighting men. We got our weapons. We're ready to go. You want us to do what? You want us to march? We're supposed to be fighting. You know, as they were doing this and Joshua was telling the plan, you know, they thought, this is crazy. There was no 
prior experience. That's right. It was a swerve. There was no prior experience to this. There was no guy around going, hey, I've seen this one before. We're going to march around this city um, once a day. We're going to be real quiet. We've done this before. It happened a couple months ago, and the wall's going to just come down. In your life, you're facing something new. There might not be a prior experience to go back to and say, hey, I've seen this before. I've seen God do it, and now you're facing a wall, and you're thinking, maybe God wants me to do something different. I'm naturally a fighting person. I fight. God gave me gifts and talents. I'll use those. That's what he gave me, so he must want me to use them. But maybe God's asking us to do something different. Maybe instead of, you know, usually when you get an argument with someone, you can kind of talk yourself out of it. And maybe God's asking you, hey, you need to spend some time with me in prayer before you even talk to that person, before you even use the gifts and the talents that I've given you to, to have communication, you need to come to me. See, they had to pivot. They had to do something that they had never done before. Pivoting teaches us to walk by faith and not by sight. And God may be asking you to pivot. You know, I've had to pivot in my life. Our, our firstborn, Myla, I read all the parenting books. I knew, you know, I was prepared. I thought it was going to be perfect. She was a very obedient child. You said, go to bed. She went to bed. She did whatever you asked her to do. Then along came River, our second child. Anybody in the room have, you know, different children? You know how they work a little differently, right? River just flows differently. He's just different. Um, you can ask him to do something. He has the biggest heart. He's the most compassionate kid ever. But a lot of times he's like, what? Hey, mom, it's raining. He's just all over the place. We're eating dinner at the table. River doesn't sit. He's got like his knees up in there, his elbows. He is, uh, he is off the stool. He's hanging, everything. The other day he had hummus on his knee. We didn't even have hummus for dinner that night. He just flows differently. I have had to pivot as a parent. I have to do different things. And sometimes in our life, when the promise doesn't come exactly like we're expecting it to come, we have to pivot. We have to do something different. We have to believe what he said. We have to have the right perspective. We have to be willing to pivot. And number three, we have to look to his presence more than his promise. How many times do we get so caught up waiting on the promise, looking for the promise, that we forget what matters the most? Being in his presence. You see, when they went out to Jericho that day, they did something they had never done before. Joshua told them to carry the ark of the Lord out with them to battle. Now, the ark of the Lord represent, represented the presence of God. He was saying, we're going to put the presence of God before us, behind us, all around us to remind us that we cannot do this alone. It was a visual reminder for them. If we make our life more about the promise, we'll miss the thing that matters the most, his presence. You know, Psalm 23, it's a familiar psalm you may have heard before. It talks about the Lord is my shepherd. And in verse 4, I love it, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The promise here isn't that we won't go through the valley. You know, often I'm thinking, don't take me through that, God. I don't want to go there. But here it reminds us the promise isn't that we won't go through the valley. It's that he's with us. It's that he's with us. You know, a few weeks ago in my own life, I saw a wall. I knew that God had called me to do what I was doing, but I saw this wall, and I, I kind of str I struggled. I struggled to hear the promise. I struggled to believe the promise. And I just said, hey, I need to spend some time with Jesus. And I remember I, I took some time with Jesus, and I cried, and I put on worship, and I just spent some time just soaking in his presence. And I walked out of there, and nothing really changed in our circumstances. Nothing changed. I didn't walk out with this plan. 
or know exactly what I should do, but I had this peace that I can't explain. And I, I want to look back because in Joshua chapter 5, if you go back, so we, we read about them entering and going into Jericho, but right before this, Joshua has a moment as a leader where he comes across um, someone that the Lord sent. The Bible says that he was near Jericho and he sees this man and he's standing there powerful and he's holding a sword sent straight from God. And Joshua looks at him and he says, are you for us? Are you against us? He's like, you, you look really awesome and strong. I need to make sure you are for us. And he asked this question and look what it says in verse 14. Read it with me on the screen. It says, neither one, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? I love this. Joshua is like, yes, God sent a messenger. He's going to give me the plan now. I'm walking in the promises of God, but I need the plan. And he is on his face. Saying, okay, give me the plan. That's what he said. He said, what do you want your servant to do? Anybody been there before? What do you want me to do? I'm facing this wall. What do you want me to do? And look what it says. The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. That's all that happened. He didn't say, hey, here's what you're going to do. He said, you're on holy ground. We cannot look to the promise more than we do his presence. We can't look to the promise and, and hold on for that thing and forget what matters the most, his presence. We're on holy ground if we're in his presence. We're on holy ground. And I got to tell you, I know Joshua stood up and said, I can do this. I can keep walking in the promises of God. I can keep going because I've heard from him. I've spent time with him. I know. Now, walking is hard. Step by step, choosing his way is hard. In fact, I don't like walking. Um, I'll try to do everything and save time. I'm just that type of person. So I want to run. Anybody else want to run into the promises of God? Just like, let's just run. Let's just get there without the heavy breathing, right? Let's run. Years ago, I was um, crazy and decided because um, someone challenged me to run a marathon. I wanted to train for a marathon. Anybody in the room ever ran a marathon? Okay, we're, we're crazy. Yeah, there's a few of us. I wanted to run a marathon. I trained. It was weeks leading up, and the day gets there, and the marathon's in Baton Rouge, and I was so thankful because I love people, and I love, I told Andy, I said, hey, if you could be there for me at certain parts of the race, like, that would be awesome, and so he's the best. He took all four kids and they all had car seats at the time, so this is crazy. All four kids got them in the minivan, love my minivan, and he drove all over the race course so he could stop and they could cheer me on. I'd be running mile three, there was Andy and there was the kids. Mile eight, there was Andy and there was the kids. They even had posters and they were holding them up and I was jogging, I was like, that's my family. And look, I see them all the time. I live with them. Something about running and doing something hard. I was like, oh, it's my family. Yeah. I was so excited. So excited to see them. Well, Andy and I discussed before the race. I said, hey, mile 18 through 21 is what I hear is the hardest part of the race. And I said, I really could use your help if you could just be there for that. Like, it'll give me something to look forward to because everybody had told me that's the hardest part of the marathon because in Baton Rouge, you go through this neighborhood and no one's there. You're all by yourself. And so I get to mile 18 and all of a sudden I see my family and I'm so excited. There they are. And my little ones, they, they even had neighborhood kids with them. I don't even know how they fit them in the van, but they did. And they are running with me, and it's just giving me so much joy and helping me to keep going. And I'm, I'm running, and I'm tired. And I, I'm, the joy is just overflowing. And then they leave. And I, I went from extreme joy to sadness to anger because I thought, 
Andy was supposed to come through 18 through 21, and now I, he came at 18. He should have waited to 21, because now I have to run 19 to 26.2 by myself. And I was done, y'all. I was done. I thought running is stupid. This is stupid. I did not like it. And um, I, I remember thinking, this is it. I'm not going to see him again, and I got to do this all. But at mile 21, I'll never forget it. I heard Stroop. And it was Andy again. I don't know how he did it, but he showed up again with all four kids. And then there was a pause, but then I heard my first name. It was a different voice. I heard Marla. And I looked up and I saw my father. I heard the voice of my father and I looked up. Now my dad drove four hours just to see me run a race. He drove four hours to see. He said, I left before you or after you started and he got there in four hours. I was still running. And I heard the voice of my father and y'all, I am not an emotional person. I don't cry. I don't cry a lot. I cry a little. <laughs> Confession. I can't be dishonest. But when I heard the voice of my father, I started crying. That's my dad. I can do this. It changed. Now, what I love about this, and I didn't know this till after the race was over. Mile 21 through 26.2, I was running by myself. But Andy, my husband, has a video. My dad ran from 21.2 broke down barriers, running through, cutting through streets, going everything to get to downtown Baton Rouge to get to the finish line before I got there just so he could watch me finish. And you know, we have a father that calls our voice to remind us of his promises. And he's gone before us, breaking down every barrier, breaking down everything that's in the way, all of our sin, all the things that are holding us back, he has broken it down so he can beat us to the finish line to say, come home, come to me, I'm right here. I'm right here. Can we stand all across this place? I wanna pray. As we walk in the promises of God, we have the right perspective, we're willing to pivot, and then we look to his presence more than the promise, and sometimes it's hard but you need to hear the voice of your father. He's saying, you got this. That voice changes everything. It's like getting a word from him in the middle of a storm. You hear peace, peace. If we can all close our eyes, I wanna pray for two types of people in the room today. And if our prayer partners can be ready on the sides, I, I want to pray for two types of people. One, maybe you say, I need the presence of God. I've been looking to the promise. I've been holding out. He's even given me personal promises that I have been believing for. A lost son or a daughter. Maybe it's a child. You've been holding on. Maybe it's healing for your body. You've been waiting and knowing that he promises healing and I just haven't received it yet. And you just say, hey, I want to be in his presence right now. If that's you, will you raise your hand all over this place? Thank you. Thank you. If you can keep your eyes closed. I want to pray for a second group of people before we worship. Maybe you say, I am so thankful that God went before me, that he loved me so much that he sent his one and only son to give his life for me. And I have never fully surrendered to him. I've been even hearing the promises of God and thinking they were for me, but I haven't told him I want them to be for me yet. I haven't said, I believe in you. Maybe you have before and you need to do it again and say, God, I am listening for your voice. If that's you, will you raise your hand? Thank you. I want to pray for you. And as I pray, after I say amen, if you want to pray with someone, our prayer partners are over here to my right and my left. You can also come to the altar if you want to pray and we're going to worship and we're going to spend time in his presence. God, I thank you for your presence. 
Lord, I thank you that you are closer than a brother. Got a whisper, a reminder that we're not alone. Lord, I pray for those who raise their hands. They want to experience your presence. Lord, they need a soaking rain of your presence, God. A reminder that when they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with them. Lord, I just pray that they would spend time with you, not just today, but tomorrow. Soaking in your presence, knowing you are with them. Encourage them right now. And also, God, I pray for those who raise their hands to receive you, to say, I surrender my heart to you. Maybe it's for the first time, or maybe it's a renewal. But God, we want to hear your voice, so we believe in you. God, we're sorry for the things we've done wrong. Forgive us. God, we confess with our mouth. We say that you are Lord. We'll stop trying to control our life. We want you to control our life. God, we surrender to you right now. Come on, with your mouth, can you tell me you love him? I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. There's nothing like spending time in your presence. We love you, Jesus, in Jesus' name.